Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming early Friday morning or thanks for watching the video or whatever. Um, I would like to continue the story about surfaces. So if you remember, or maybe you don't, the surface was this idea that we have some space, like our swim ring, and locally our swim ring is made out of little disks, and there are many of those little disks living everywhere um, in my little swim ring. And the point is, kind of, this is a global object, and globally it's clearly not um, equal to something like a sphere. A sphere. But locally, I literally can't tell. Locally, there are just uh, little circles everywhere, little disks everywhere, and we can make a, a life experiment if you want. So uh, the surface of the Earth is the surface. But we literally can't tell. If you just look around, everything just looks like a, looks like a, uh, like a disc, right? The, the ground just looks like a disc. A slightly strange disc, there are some chairs around or whatever, but it's essentially a disc. So a very nice experiment. If you would do this on water, you literally see the disc. Um, but that doesn't imply that our Earth actually is, is round. It, it could be one of, the, one of those objects here or, or something worse. Uh, so we kind of need some methods to tell surfaces apart or to describe them in a little bit better way. And that's what I'm going to discuss uh, today. Um, and that's what we're going to do. So I will reformulate the problem. So the usual idea here is that I always reformulate hard problems until they're kind of combinatorial in nature. And we are very convinced that the two problems are essentially the same. And then there is some proof involved that they are the same, which I'm completely ignoring, and just study the combinatorial uh, description of those. So everything will be combinatorial in about half an hour or so. So right now it's like little disks on surfaces. Okay, and the way to make something into combinatorics, let me just uh, go through this, is we want to do the following. We have some surface. Here's my favorite one, one that I can always draw and it kind of always makes some sense to me. Um, and what I want is I want to have lots of those disks and they're lying around on my surface uh, and eventually if I would have time and space to draw enough of them, they would just cover the whole surface. So I could draw as many of them as I need to to cover the whole surface. And then we can kind of try to use local information about the disk. Uh, the disk is easy, plus some properties of how those disks are glued together to say something about the red object here in question, about our little, little torus. So remember this guy was called torus, and that was usually denoted by T, uh, such as torus. So what we do is, we do exactly that. Uh, that's here's the definition. So we have a decomposition into those little um, axes, and the axes are, you should think of them as being our little disks. And there is some patchwork, like down here, which just formally is a map, so y, so this equals y in the definition above. And those little things here, these are the x's, x whatever, one, two, up to xr. And I would like them to cover the whole space. So there's some subjective map, and because uh, we are doing topology, we want it to be Continuous subjective map. So the main point here is subjective. And we call the space, the blue one in this case, we call it an identification space for the little y. And that's maybe not so bad because the identification space, at least in my example down here, is somehow certainly in some sense easier than uh, the red object itself because it's just, just a bunch of disks. And we can do that very efficiently, and that's kind of not quite clear by now, but we'll show you plenty of examples. We can do that very efficiently and essentially describe all surfaces by a very small number of disks, uh, which eventually will look like polygons, but remember that a disk and a polygon is the same anyway. So eventually I will use the disk as, a, as any form of polygon. So our main goal is to describe how, and that's kind of the combinatorial approach, how those guys, which are much easier, are kind of the same as those guys here, which are certainly way more sophisticated as objects. 
And that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool idea, and it's fairly new, actually. So this whole idea of surfaces are around for ages, obviously. I mean, the surface of the, uh, the Earth or something. Um, but to model them in this topological fashion, locally and combinatorially, is pretty new. It goes back to roughly the 1950s of the last century, uh, which is not old Greek geometry. It still sounds like very far away. But for math, actually 70 years or 70, 80 years is not all that much. Anyway, the, the result is pretty cool. So um, stay with me for a while. It takes us a while to really get there and to describe it completely combinatorial. But that's the idea. That's the whole idea of this topology lecture is that we have some real world objects. And I'll give you some real world examples, some more real world examples later. And we want to describe real world objects. They're very complicated. We want to describe them using some combinatorial approach. OK. And that's just what I said. So this patchwork is somehow much easier. That's kind of the hope. It should be much easier to understand than um, the space itself. And it's really, really, you should think about the patchwork. Remember my example of a surface being a pair of pens. And now your pair of pens has just a lot of patches. And eventually, it could, could be still be a pair of pens, of course. So we just have many patches now instead of one per point. Let me show you how that works. The easiest example is a cylinder. The cylinder is a space, well, <laughs> it looks like a cylinder, I guess. Uh, so let's have a look at it, how to find a nice combinatorial object that is essentially, encodes essentially the same information as a cylinder does. So what I do is pretty simple. I cut it, take a cylinder, and cut it along one of the, its, um, just its surface. So if you cut it along the surface and then bend it open, what you will get, so bend here, what you will get looks like this. So, um, so this boundary circle is B, this boundary circle is C, and this edge is A. So it's essentially, and all of you have done that, it's essentially a flat space now, and it comes from identifying the rectangle, identifying the two uh, opposite edges, the north and the south in my picture, of the rectangle. So I, I just went from here to here, but you can also go from here to here, and the inverse operation is identify uh, A and B, right? If you think of this as an object where, well, here's my disk, obviously, this is clearly a disk, very, very, very flat space, but now I have the extra rule in my flat space that if I leave here, I actually re-enter here. And take a note of this little arrow. It will turn up several times, but right now, let's ignore it. So this is a rectangle plus the additional information that if I leave to the north, I re-enter to the south. And obviously, if I leave to the south, I re-enter to the north. And that's essentially the same information. And it's pretty good news, because you have a two-dimensional object. And now you have it's still two-dimensional, but it's flat. It's a very flat object. and contains exactly uh, the same information. And this is our little patchwork. It's a very, very silly patchwork in this case. It's just one patch, but it's still pretty good. It's, a, it's one patch, a very simple object, together with information that leaving to the north, uh, you enter to the south. That's pretty good. I mean, this is a pretty good start for this philosophy. There's a complicated object, and it's essentially a rectangle. And rectangles are not very complicated. We hope at least rectangles are not very complicated. Let me do the same trick with the analog, which might be a little bit easier to think of. So if you take the cylinder and you just take it in your hands and you squeeze this one down, you end up with a picture that looks like this, which is just a disk with a hole. And you can play the same game. If you cut, if you would build this out of paper, it would cut it along A. You could clearly just bend it open, right? You could just clearly bend this open and get this picture here which is uh, essentially, which is exactly the same, has the same rule, leaving to the north. Well, let's do it for the south in this case. Leaving to the south, you re-enter to the north, um, which shows you, and that's kind of the goal we have in mind, that actually those two spaces are really the same because they come from the same rectangle. I hope that makes some sense. So those two rectangles are clearly the same, but we got them in a slightly different way. If you would, I say it again, if you just build all of these out of paper and just cut along with the edge A, 
uh, you can just really just bend it open and you get the picture on the right. Okay, that's a really good start. So that's pretty simple. I like it. It's pretty good. So we have a rectangle instead of a cylinder. Ooh, it's a pretty, pretty huge step, actually. And it turns out that you can essentially do the same all the time. And that's, that's magic. That's, then it's really magic. So let's try to cut the torus. So if you would cut the torus, um, well, I prefer this cut here. Not quite sure this is the way how you would cut. This is not the way how you would cut a bagel, by the way. But for us, this is a better cut. If I cut along here, I get a cylinder. Does that make sense? If I cut the torus, I bend it open, and I get a little cylinder here. So here, um, so the other way around is would be identifying those edges. Take a cylinder and just bend it, and bend it together, and identifying those two edges. Okay, and we know what to do with the cylinder, so we continue cutting, and we get this object. Same rules. So B and B and A and A. Um, clearly, this is very flat, so here's my little disk. But now the rule is if I exit to the north, I enter to the south. But I have an additional rule. If I access, ex exit here, I enter here. And this corresponds to um, the two directions going around the torus. So the, uh, so the black one is here in the green one is going around like this. And we just model that locally. And people have done that very often. So this is a really good picture of the torus, right? It's just flat, and you have those two extra rules, what happens if you pass over the boundary. And actually, people have done that, and they're still doing this. So if you ever become a game designer, for example, let me show you a picture. So um, in very old games, that's pretty clear. So in very old games, so here's a Pac-Man picture. Uh, in very old games, the world was just one screen, so it was kind of easy to see. And Pac-Man could uh, exit here and would enter here, and could exit here and would enter here. So actually, the whole Pac-Man game is just taking place on a cylinder because it's much easier to just model this rectangle here, I guess. So game designers tend to be lazy. They just model those rectangles. Um, together with the rules such that you don't run into boundaries because you want kind of a model in the infinite world, and it turns out to be a torus. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is not because this is old. So modern game designers still do this, just the world is too big so you can't really see it anymore. It's not just one screen. But if you take your favorite um, whole world game, very new, whatever it is, I bet that the world is still a torus because it's so easy to actually encode. It's really just a rectangle with two rules, and there is no boundary anymore, because whenever you enter the exit, you can already enter, always enter again, and so on. That's why a game designers actually like this, like this a lot for, uh, for games. And another reason why they do this, I think, is because they're lazy. You could ask, why don't they do a sphere? Isn't that more reasonable? Like, our Earth is a sphere, so they should do the same for the sphere. Turns out that the picture for the sphere is a little bit more complicated, and this is just uh, as nice as it gets. So let's see how the sphere works. So I wanted to play a cutting game on the sphere again, and it's a bit easier for me to think of it as a double cone. I can just do that topologically and just uh, take the south pole, take the north pole, and just stretch it a little bit to the north and to the south, I guess, or whatever you want to call that. And I cut it. Well, there's one edge I can cut it. And you get the little bit of a strange looking space. But if you think about it for a second, so it's not really a rectangle right now. So you have an edge A here, and you have an edge A here. And the rule is, of course, this rule. And if you think of this as being built out of paper, and you would really bend it again up along the edges to identify those edges, you would actually really get um, the cylinder picture. And this looks a bit more complicated. It's not a rectangle. It gives you the sphere. Um, and that's why maybe game designers don't like it so much. Because in order to make it into a rectangle, we need to do a trick. I will do it, make it into a rectangle in a second. We'll see that it works. I just subdivide my edge A, call it B and C, pull the whole thing straight, and I get a rectangle with a slightly strange rule now. So let's see 
if you exit here, you enter here, right? So C and C are identified. So if I exit here, I enter here. And B and B are identified. So if I uh, exit here, I enter here, which apparently is a slightly strange rule. Um, you think of this as being the Earth. It really works. So this is how usually planes would fly. They would take some really strange uh, roads uh, on this, on this uh, piece of paper. And if the Earth would be a torus, the, the, the planes, the airplanes would fly very different roads. Anyway, so it's slightly more complicated, and that's why game designers do, do prefer the torus. Actually. They also might, maybe don't care, I don't know, but uh, most games are actually modeled on a torus. Um, fun fact, so, so this is again what, what I like to, and you already see that I have two different uh, polygon expressions of the same surface. I have one using the square, the bottom one, and I have one using a, a polygon that we will use, but the greens, for some strange reasons, never gave a name to that polygon. It's called a two-gon, a bigon, or a digon, whatever you like it to be. Um, and somehow the Greeks started ca uh, counting from the triangle for some reasons and always ignored that polygon. But we will have it on our list. So um, the two-gon, that's how I will call it, is uh, a polygon with two sides. That's why it's called a two-gon, I guess. And it gives you identification space of our good old friend, the soccer ball. So if you would like to do this at home, you could take a soccer ball and cut it apart, and you will actually see um, that it works. Maybe that was not a good recommendation. Don't cut, cut soccer balls apart. But anyway, um, I will skip the projective plane for time reasons and show you the projective plane later in a different um, polygon expression. So here's this funny space that almost looks like a cylinder, but it has a twist. Um, so if you cut that, you get this space. Oh, I should have given names to those edges. I didn't. So this is A, this is A, this is B, and this is C. So B and C, uh, so B and B, uh, B and C are the boundary components of the space, and A is where I cut. And now I have a funny rule here. So if I exit here, you can see this arrow is pointing here, and it's roughly halfway uh, or what is it, three quarters in the arrow direction, I actually enter here because that's how I identify those sides. I take them and I don't glue them together like with a cylinder, but I follow the arrows and I glue it together with a twist and I get the picture uh, on the right. Note that it almost looks like a cylinder, just locally it's the same, just uh, the rule is slightly different. Right? To, to identify surfaces, what I propose, I say it again, I would like to have a very flat picture plus some rule, some entering and re-entering or exiting and entering rule uh, for the surface, and that should determine the surface. So we go on. Here's another one, a um, little bit complicated to think of. Let me draw the, uh, the enter and exit rule. So here, and I come in here, look at the orientations, but here, this one goes in this direction, in this direction. So if I go out here, I will re-enter from the bottom, actually. Because again, there's some funny twist in. Uh, if you try to, try to actually model this in real world, what you would get is a cylinder by just identifying B and B um, as before. And then this is A and A. Uh, let, me, let me just draw it on the slides. It's better for the video, I guess. A and A but you would identify them with a twist. And this is really hard to imagine, and you can't do that actually in three space, and you get one of those uh, very strange pictures of a surface which doesn't really live in three space. So you would need four dimensions to actually realize it. And that's why it gets so very hard to imagine. So if you try to glue two ends of a cylinder together with a twist, you always need some form of self-intersection. And here is the form of self-intersection. But it's a completely legal surface in the sense that we still have our local rule here. Here's our disk. And we have the entering, the exiting and entering rule. And kind of all of these will determine some form of a surface. Um, so the easier the surface in some sense, the easier the, the local picture of the surface. And this beast is called, oops, that was really bad. Give me another try. This beast is called the Klein bottle. And I usually denote it by uh, a K, 
So it's, as I said, it's named after Klein, and it was a mistranslation. Um, kind of people thought maybe it looks like a bottle, so we translated to, uh, if you want, that this, this doesn't really look like a bottle. But anyway, it is a mistranslation. It actually, should actually be called Klein surface. But uh, nowadays, it's known as a Klein bottle. That's what it is. Life is never fair. So let me make this a little bit more formal. So a polygon, we all know what a polygon is. Um, I will show you polygons in a second. And you can think of this as an embedding of our cyclic graph and just fill in the space. So it's, um, it's a standard embedding of the cyclic graph and you fill in the space so you get the, the two gun, the, the, the two gun, the digon or whatever, the Greeks don't have a name as I said, and the triangle, the three gun, uh, the square, the four gun, the pentagon, the five gun, the hexagon, the six gun, and at one point I'm running out of um, names, I guess, and I just go call them n guns, like n for the number of edges. And they are just really just disks, or all of them are just disks. You can show that using exactly the same ideas as I showed you last time. So this is our local model of the surface, and we would have like to have some rules how to, re uh, to exit and enter um, throughout, uh, through the edges. You'll see several examples in a second. So really, really simple. So we are just, the only thing that we changed to graph theory is now we fill in, so we're one dimension higher, we fill in the, the empty area, and it actually has a, has, a space, has a face. Okay, I call it m gun, as I said, and it has m sides, m vertices, equivalently, um, and it's exactly the corresponding space that you think they are. And they are, they're not quite, the cyclic graph, there's the cyclic graph plus a face. We are doing graph theory with faces now. That's kind of the idea here. I hope that makes some sense. Um, and this one is a little bit silly. Um, but, but for me, by definition, it's, so the cyclic graph, just for the loop, for me, by definition, that's C2. It has two edges and two vertices. So this one is always a bit special. By definition, I let it to be um, whatever you see here on the middle left of the slide. Polygons, not so hard, and we use that as our identification spaces for surfaces. And after about a little bit of going around and trying to make everything nicely precise and massaging it a little bit, it will turn out that surfaces are essentially the same as polygons plus the enter or exit rule for those beasts. Which is a cool statement if you think about it for a second. But we are not there yet. Um, I just do a trick now. I redefine what I mean by a surface. I just define it to be an identification space um, for, uh, given by one of those polygons, by some polygons. I'll show you some examples in a second. And the, the polygons themselves, I call them a polygon, polygonal de decomposition of the surface. But they're the polygonal forms of the surfaces. Um, and this essentially agrees with the, and essentially should be in huge quotation marks because there is some non-trivial step showing that the definitions are actually equivalent. And I'm going to ignore that and I'm just going with um, this definition. But you can kind of already see why they are equivalent. Here everything is locally made out of polygons and polygons are disks, so it should be kind of, kind of the same. Um, and it's informally, and that's what, how I would like to think about it, is it's really just this patchwork not just of disks, a little bit easier to control combinatorially, but equivalent are polygons. So it's a patchwork made out of polygons. Okay. And we can have many, so we'll show you many, many more examples. And uh, a, 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 a game question I always like to ask, so in the sense of if there's an exam or something, I like to ask a question, I give you a polygon with a rule and you are supposed to identify the surface. And I show you a lot of tricks to do that, and in the end, there will be a, an algorithm to do it eventually. Okay. So instead of having a graph now, we have now vector, uh, vertices, edges, and faces. It's a two-dimensional version of a graph. So um, a polygonal dec decomposition is determined by vertices, edges, and faces, and a certain rule how to glue things together. So I will write VEF very similar to the, to the graph world. Okay, let me just go through this 
and then we go to an example. So I will draw polygon decompositions for you on the next slide and then 112 examples. Um, and I will do it in the following way. I will label the edges to make it easier to read because those are the ones we would like to identify. Remember I had A, Bs and Cs already on those pictures. And I will color the edges just to make it easier to see. The color is not really important. The direction is important because remember there is a difference whether I identify something with the same direction or so some identification of this form or whether you do some identification of this form which always comes with a little twist here. This changes the surface. So I should keep track of the orientation or the direction of the edges. Um, so let me just show you an example, then you will see what it is. And if you would like to go back to the slide, you obviously can. Um, oh, sorry, that was too fast. So for the annulus, I would draw this picture and let's see whether that makes sense. So I draw a polygon, the polygon is the square. Uh, remember the annulus was, maybe I should draw it, was this picture here, and my cutting was here, this was A, and I have a B outside, for example, and I have a C inside. And I do it like this. So the, the uh, exiting rule is given by identifying whatever kind of letter you see, or colored edges you see, of the same type. So B and C are free, they don't do anything, so they're really worse. So you can't exit uh, out, out of B and you can't exit out of C and obviously you shouldn't because as you can see in the picture you would uh, really bump your head here if you would run into uh, B or C but you can clearly exit or walk over A and you can see the enter and exit rule just on the picture by, well this picture says identify A and A uh, along the orientation so that's the enter and exit rule here. I hope it makes some sense. Here's a picture for the sphere that we had before. Here's a picture from the torus. Let me draw the torus again. Um, so there is a way to move around like this, which is I exit here, I enter here, and there's a way to move around like this, which is this rule here, and it's completely determined. So this was our little, little game. So most games were torus, remember. Um, and it's completely determined just by the polygon picture. I tell you there's an A, there's an A, there's a B and a B, and the Bs are supposed to be identified along the orientations, and the A's are supposed to be identified along the orientation. And the next one, so here's another picture of the projective plane. This is always hard to imagine, um, so, but here's the polygon picture of it, which is maybe a little bit easier. Note that, and this is kind of crucial, the little information, it looks very simple. It's just one square with a few numbered ed or labeled edges, but it's actually secretly, and it's kind of very cool, secretly it's actually a potentially complicated object living somewhere. A projective plane, for example, again, needs at, mo uh, at least four dimensions to be really realized. But as a polygon, it's pretty simple. Uh, note that if you exit here, you kind of enter here because of the twist of the arrow. If you exit here, you enter somewhere down here. And it gets, it's a very strange object. It's kind of a very strange object. But it's totally as simple as a polygon. It's not so bad. It's AB, AB. It almost looks the same as the torus. Note the difference if you read along the torus, you read AB and then opposite A, sorry, opposite A, opposite A, opposite B. While if you read along, um, the projective plane you read always in the same direction. And that's how you see the difference between those. They have, they're really just the same object, but they have a different enter and exit rule, um, just given by the many errors you see here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, let me say that. So since we identify, this is a very good question. So the question was, um, if you have free edges like in the annulus, does the orientation actually matter? No, it doesn't because we don't identify them with anything. But we still draw orientations. So you'll see in a second why I would like to do that. It makes it easier to really read off the surface. But they don't change anything. Absolutely right. Same uh, for the Mobius strip. 
So B and C are free, so they don't do anything. But it's very important that A here is twisted, so A goes this way, and here it goes this way, and that's exactly the difference between the annulus and oh, the Möbius strip, where you twist in, uh, where you twist along the edge A. The Klein bottle looks again very similar. Uh, let me just do it again. So A goes like this, and B goes like this. So here, for example, B, this is not this surface, as you can see here, slightly different anti and exit rule. So it's, it's the same in the north and south, but it's different in the east and west. And here it's also different in both directions. I uh, know it, it's the same, now, now it's the same uh, east-west, but it's different uh, north-south. And we encode that using the orientation. So orientation, crucial on edges that we want to identify, unimportant on the other edges. And that's pretty cool. I mean, all of these surfaces just are just polygons, and very simple polygons in this case, just, just a square with some rule how to enter or exit the square. OK. Let me just. Um, so here comes something that is interesting. So every polygon is homeomorphic to a closed disk. That's kind of clear. But I told you I don't want this, these spaces, because locally here you don't have a disk anymore. So in, no matter what kind of picture I draw as a polygon decomposition, you have never three or more edges with the same label, because we would identify them and would get a picture that locally looks like this. In other words, in all my polygon decompositions, every edge appears either once, that's a free edge, or twice, that's an edge we identify. I'll show you an example in a second. And this is really why I want that. So as soon as you identify three or more edges, you get a book. Um, the, the binding is the identification line, and that's not a surface. So there is here, let me draw it again. Here, you clearly don't have a, a disk neighborhood anymore. It's kind of this little book type object neighborhood. That's not a surface, so we never identify three or more edges. And there are various ways to do different decompositions so you can make things fine. I will see actually uh, how that works. So there are infinitely many different polygon decompositions of the same surface. So we need some tools. That's exactly my game that I wanted to, to uh, you to think about at one point. Um, I give you one and you are supposed to identify the surface. And since it's not one-to-one, -one, it's, not um, it's not completely straightforward how to do it. So it's really a little non-trivial game. It's not so hard. It turns out to be really, really smooth and nice. But it's still a little game we would like to play. OK, let me skip that. And let me just, uh, sorry. Let me just make it this way. So. Um, we can always have one polygon, but I will show you many polygons. As, as long as we have a connected surface, we can always do one polygon. You just cut it somewhere, and you get uh, one polygon of the same surface. It does not depend on the plots. OK, so let me do an example for you. That this is absolutely non-trivial. OK, so let's do that together. So the torus is the object from before, but if you, for example, cut it a little bit along edge C and bend it open, you actually get a hexagon presenting the same object. So identifying C and C, so if you think of C and C as being the cut, and now you push it together, you actually get this picture. So if you push those together, you actually do get this picture. And that's my little game that I would like to play. So I will show you one of them and you're supposed to identify the surface. That's, um, I'm not saying that's easy right now, but let's just go with the flow for now. And I can cut along D, for example, can go on, and I get an Aitken. So I have an Aitken decomposition of um, the, to the, what is it, the torus. And I can do some more fancy things, and I can actually also cut it into two pieces. So let's look at the bottom. So this is uh, one polygon, because if I exit through A, so where's A? Oh, A is up here, so I enter here. So this is actually a connected picture. It just looks disconnected in, um, in the polygon decomposition. 
So here C is kind of harmless. C is here, but F again. So F should be somewhere here probably. There you go. And E and E and D and D. So this is actually a connected surface. And it takes some mental yoga to see that it's actually the same as the torus. And that's exactly the little game um, we need to kind of solve or find a good way to solve it. So we want really just an easy way to identify a surface for one of its infinitely many polygon decompositions. So I could, for example, go on with the cutting game and I could go up to 18 guns or whatever, just cut in more edges, it gets huge and complicated and we want an easy way to say, oh, that's actually a torus or that's a Clyde bottle or whatever, that's a sphere. And it's not completely obvious. So the miracle is, in the end, that it's, it's not hard to do. And there's an algorithm to do it. And that's uh, the miracle that we can't see today anymore, but that I will show you definitely ne uh, next time. OK, keep that in mind. That's a game. We have the easy pictures, but we're running into the problem that we have infinitely many pictures presenting the same object. So we need some tool to um, kind of distinguish them or to, to say whether two very different looking, so this, the, the, this one here and this one here, they present the same surface, for example, but they look very different. One of them is two, uh, are two polygons, one of them is one polygon. So it can get actually um, very strange. Hope that makes some sense. So for example, I could ask a question like, here's a polygon decomposition, what surface is that? Well, it looks connected to me. That's, that's something I can say, because if I enter through I here, I get to the other side. Um, but otherwise, so just a priori telling what it is is not so trivial. So, and I don't expect you to be able to do this right now. So we can't. Right now, I think we don't have really any good method to do it. I could just write it down. And there is one method by just sitting down and staring at the picture until you see the answer, but that's certainly not a good way of doing it. Okay, so we need language and technology, and I will show you absolutely great language and technology to do that. And then the whole problem is solved. And then whatever kind of polygon decomposition I throw at you, you can just uh, use a technology and it's been spit out, this is a torus or whatever, this is a projective plane or whatever it is. Okay. So let's do something a little bit easier now again. Um, so this was a little bit to scare you if you want. So it can get really complicated and we need some tools to attack the problem. So here's the first step. Um, so let me just go to the picture. Okay. So if I have a polygon decomposition, I call an edge free if it appears once. Uh, so downstairs, for example, here, A and B are free edges. Right? I, say, I just write F. A and B are free. It appears once. Um, F is not a free edge. It appears twice. But C, for example, is a free edge. Let me see. D is a free edge. A is a free edge, I guess. And B is a free edge. So everything that appears once. And that's easy to check. You just walk along. You just count along the, the uh, you just walk along the boundary of, of your, of your polygon and just check whether it appears twice or not. Okay, those guys are called free and the other ones are called paired. So E is paired, uh, F is paired, for example. And the paired ones display a different role. The paired ones are identified and the free ones are not identified. And the boundary of S, so here's the disk and the boundary of the disk is, of course, the outside circle. And the boundary is always a union of three edges. So that's actually, I will show you a nice example in a second here. Um, here you can actually see it, right? The only thing I've done from in the first step, I've cut it or marked it, and I called the edges A and very ugly B, A and B. So the boundary is actually just a union of those three edges and the same, uh, three edges and the same here. So A, B, C, D are all three edges, and this is just now the circle with uh, four marks, so A, B, C, D. And what I've done then is I cut it in 
E's um, between D and A. So I cut a little, little, do a little cut here, bend the cut open, I get the E, and I cut it in F's between B and C, I guess. What is the color for F? Maybe this one? Uh, not really. Brown, do I have brown? Well, I have this one. Uh, anyway, so I cut it in F here. I don't write F because I have F for free here. And I get this picture. And in this picture, you can, so if you squeeze F and E, you get to here and so on. And you can see that this one here and this one here, let me just mark it in the, in the polygon. So this guy here and this guy here, they're actually one edge. Um, so they're four edges, but they correspond to the same boundary, and I'll show you on the next slide a way to identify that. Okay, so the first step is to, dis you have this decomposition, D just max Fs and Ps for the free edges and the paired edges. And what you do then, so here for example, um, all of them are paired, there are no free edges, and uh, that's why those spaces have no boundary. So everything is paired, so A, A, B, B, F is always A, A, B, B, so there can't be any boundary. In other words, the first easy check is whether your space has a boundary by just counting three edges, and if you don't find any, it has no boundary, and if you find one, it has boundary. Well, that's not so bad, that's an easy counting, so all of these are uh, boundary free and well in the rule in the enter exit rule you can see that because you will never bump your head you can always enter and exit somewhere so eventually so whatever here and here something like that and here and here I guess so you never bump your head uh, on those surfaces while on this surface the one from before you clearly would bump your head at one point because there is an edge and here as well, because A is not paired, so you can't leave, you bump your head. So free edges are boundary edges. Let's look at those. They had a boundary, and you'll see it, because they have free edges. Uh, so we have two boundary components. Uh, this one has two boundary components. It has two free edges. And this one here is another example with two free edges. So they clearly have a boundary. And it's very easy, it's a very easy check. You just count, you just check whether something has um, free edges or not. So let's have a look at a bigger example. Okay, so what you need to do is, if I give you one of those, um, let's check for paired edges and not paired edges. And I claim that B, C, D, and H are free. So let's see, free, so there's no other B as far as I can see. C is free, there's no other C as far as I can see. D is free, uh, no other D, very good. H is free, uh, no other H, very good. So A is here and here, E is here and here, whereas F, F is here and here, and G is here and here. So the first step you do is, you do this trick, and you already know whatever kind of surface you're up for, it has a boundary because you have three edges going, floating around. Four of them, actually. So you have, uh, what is it, B, C, D, H. I hope that makes some sense. And then you can actually also already determine what boundary it is. So how many boundary components? Let me show you how that works. Um, so what you can do is, let me just fill in all the, all the labels. So I haven't told you anything about the vertices yet. But they might be identified because you pair edges. Let me just show you. So this vertex that I call X here is the end point of A. But A is down here as well. So this vertex is also at uh, X. Yeah? Does that make some sense? Because I pair edge A with edge A on the bottom. Those two vertices get paired as well. So they're the same objects. Uh, y is at the top of A. So it's also here at the bottom of uh, also here at the bottom. X, let me follow X. X is also at the bottom of E. So um, it's, ooh, so this is wrong. It should, this should be X here at the bottom of E because E is actually paired with E down here. So um, the X edge maps down to the X edge down here. 
And now it's at the bottom of F, so it actually also goes to here. And I really made a mistake that I will correct in the, in the slides. So this is also X, kind of fun. So you just need to follow the edges. It's the bottom of, of F, so it's at the bottom of the F, other F file as well. And now it's also at the uh, beginning of E, so here it is actually correct. So it goes from here to here, and well, C is just what it is. And then it stops because C is a free edge. So the, X, uh, the vertex X is actually spread over the whole polygon. And you figure that out by just following the, pair, the paired edges. Now let me see whether I can track Y. Um, y is beginner of A, beginner of A, C is uh, free, so do, I don't go anywhere. B is free, so I don't go anywhere. So Y is just where it is. Let's have a look at W. So W is at the beginning of G, so it's here. Uh, I should mark the Ws. Beginning of G, so it's here. And that's the start of F. So it's also here. That's the end of G, so that's also here. And D is a free edge, so that's where it gets stuck. And I have one more, uh, which is just here between those two edges. OK, so the, all, all Zs in this picture are actually axes. And I did that wrong. It's very simple, but it's a little bit confusing. And you, you get it wrong all the time. So let's try again. So we really just follow. So W is very impressive. W just jumps around. So W here is at the top of G, so it's also here, right? It goes from here to here. Now it's the top of H, uh, F, so it actually jumps to here as well. Now it's the bottom of G, so it actually jumps to here as well. And that's where it stops. So it, there are four images of the same vertex. So this polygon, identified as a surface, only has X, Y, uh, W, and V. It only has four vertices in total. And now let's follow um, the B. So B here, do I have a nice picture or do I do it live? No, I don't have a nice picture. Uh, so B goes from, what is it, uh, W to Y. This is B. So let's look at the three edges. C is green. C goes from, what is it, Y to X. Um, D is what color? Red. D is red. Oh, this was sorry. This was C. D goes from V to W. And the missing one, H, goes from what is that for a color? Uh, let's do it this way. Um, H goes from X to V. So actually, if you stick them together. You see that this is just one edge. It goes from X to V, it goes from V to W, it goes from W to Y, and from Y to X. So although they are completely spread over the surface, they're just one edge. And you can read that uh, in, 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 in the surface, they're just one edge. So the surface has one boundary component. All right, that was a bit fast, so let me try to say again. So you count the number of free edges, you look actually what the vertices are. That's a bit tricky. You just follow them like I followed a W. And then you will see actually whether those uh, free edges correspond to one boundary component or not. So what happened here is secretly they were of this form where it's easier to see, but completely hidden in of this form here, but completely hidden uh, kind of in the polygon decomposition. They're just one boundary component just kind of weirdly spread over the decomposition. And that's the fun game you want to play here first. So you mark the edges, remember the Z was wrong. Um, and you actually see that they're all the same. So this object has one boundary component. There's one boundary component, one boundary. OK, so uh, we can't say much more about the rest right now. And this is essentially where I will stop. Um, so let me just give you one more definition. And um, next time we analyze how we can say more about. So right now, I give, give you a way to, it gets a bit confusing, but if you do it once, it's actually not so hard. So you follow the vertices that tells you uh, how actually the axes correspond to one another, and you can read off the boundary components. Let me just make one more definition, and then you are free to go. Um, 
So the Euler characteristic, or remember that was a very, very crucial datum that we had for graphs. Now a surface is a graph with faces, so we so should say something about the faces again, and we just add the number of faces. So it's vertices minus edges plus faces. Show you some examples, and then we are done. And it turns out that this is the crucial measure for everything you want to know about surfaces. I recall that for a graph, it was just um, the number of vertices minus the number of edges, and we just add the number of faces. So the general rule is you put a plus for the, for the even dimensional ones, and put a minus for the odd dimensional ones. The vertices, even dimensional, so plus, edges, uh, odd dimensional, one dimensional, minus, faces, uh, even dimensional, two dimensional, so you put a plus, and so on. And right now, we don't know anything about this, but this is a crucial invariant, and it doesn't depend on the polygon decomposition, which is an amazing statement um, in itself. So this is a number you attach to a surface, very similar to the number or the other characteristic we attached to um, the graph, and it's the most important number you can attach to a surface. Let me show you the examples, and then I'll let you go. Um, so how do we do this? Euler characteristic is two, I claim. So the, what is usually very easy is the number of faces, because in all these pictures, you see one face, namely the polygon itself. And here I see two s, so this is the number of faces. So minus one, this is f. I see two edges, a and b. Oh, sorry, this is my, uh, plus one. Not nonsense. Minus two, and let's see how many vertices we have. This is an X and it's stuck here. This is a top, this is an, a Y and it's stuck here. This is at the top of A, so it's also here, so it's a Z. So this actually secretly has three vertices. So it's three minus two plus one. And it looks like all our characteristic is two. I will do one more for you and you can check on this slide whether you actually, uh, so this is a very nice slide to check whether you understood this kind of fun, uh, whatever you want to call it, game. Um, to count the number of vertices. So let's do the torus. So this one here is down here, yeah, because it's at the end of A, the start of B, so it's here, so it's up here. So actually we only have one vertex, X, so it's one. Um, how many edges? We have two edges, minus two. The face is always easy. We have one face, so the other characteristic is zero. And you can do uh, the same count for the others. And that's why I stopped.